All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ann Chang. I'm an associate clinical professor of law here at Arizona State University, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. On behalf of our law school and our legal writing faculty, I'd like to welcome you all to our second of three workshops on innovation in legal writing courses. And thank you all for taking the time today to join us um, for what promises to be an exciting and <laughs> informative workshop. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone, if you're not speaking, please remember to uh, mute your microphone. And if you joined us for our September workshop, you may recall that our focus then was on innovative course ideas in upper level legal writing. If you missed that workshop, don't worry. You can view a recording by going to the ASU Law Legal Method and Writing webpage. You can find it simply by typing ASU Law Legal Method and Writing into your web browser, scroll down and you'll see a video there. So today's focus is on how to teach and present material in an innovative way in the context of a traditional advanced or upper level legal writing course. We're going to hear from four distinguished scholars and professors in the legal writing community. I'm going to introduce our speakers up front and then each speaker will present for about 12 minutes. We'll reserve time at the end for your questions. During the question and answer session, you can unmute your microphone if you'd like to ask a question. You can also send me questions directly through the chat function and I can ask those questions on your behalf. First, we will hear today from Professor Sarah Ricks. Sarah is a distinguished clinical professor at Rutgers Law School, Camden, where she teaches legal writing and current issues in civil rights litigation. She also co-teaches the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Seminar. Sarah's casebook, Current Issues in Constitutional Litigation, integrates the teaching of legal doctrine and legal skills and is widely adopted. Since 2008, Sarah has served as a Philadelphia mayoral appointee on the Philadelphia Commission for Human Relations, the agency that enforces the city's anti-discrimination laws. In 2009, Ricks was elected to the American Law Institute. Sarah graduated from Yale Law School where she co-founded the Yale Journal of Law and Feminism. After clerking uh, for the US District Court in Philadelphia, she joined Pepper Hamilton as litigation associate. Excuse me. Um, let's see. And, um, uh, and then she became an appellate and legislative attorney for the city of Philadelphia. During her seven years in the Philadelphia Law Department, she litigated civil rights claims before federal and state appellate courts. She joined the Rutgers faculty in 2001. We will then hear from Professor Kirsten Davis. Kirsten Davis is a professor of law, co-director of the Institute for the Advancement of Legal Communication, faculty director, online legal education strategies, Stetson University College of Law. Kirsten teaches legal communication courses as well as professional responsibility and the First Amendment. Her research and scholarship focuses on legal communication, law and rhetoric, professionalism, professional identity, and professional ethics. She founded Stetson's Institute for the Advancement of Legal Communication, a collective of Stetson faculty whose work addresses the pressing issues of effective and persuasive legal communication. Kirsten writes a recurring blog on rhetoric and law, the raw bar for the appellate advocacy blog. Our third speaker will be Professor Tessa Dysart. Tessa is the Assistant Director of Legal Writing and Clinical Professor of Law at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. She also serves as the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Appellate Practice and Process, which was acquired by the University of Arizona Law in June 2020. Professor Dysart writes and speaks nationally on appellate advocacy issues. With the Honorable Leslie H. Southwick of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, she co-authored the third edition of Winning on Appeal, Better Briefs and Oral Arguments. And our final speaker will be Professor Susan Chesler. Uh, Sue is a clinical professor of law at Arizona State University Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, where she teaches contract drafting, legal method and writing, and legal advocacy. Her scholarly interests focus on transactional skills, contract drafting, and legal writing. And her current research examines the benefits of incorporating narrative techniques in transactional drafting to better effectuate parties' interests. As you can see, we have a wonderful panel today. So I ask that we now turn our attention to our first speaker, starting with Professor Sarah Ricks. She's going to discuss how our upper level Rutgers Law students sharpen their writing and oral skills while producing free legal research and writing projects requested by nonprofits or government agencies. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, Sarah Ricks from Rutgers Law School. And as I was listening to what the first um, panel presentations uh, were about, I'm wondering whether this might have been fit a little bit better with that first 
um, grouping, because what I'm going to talk about is exactly what uh, Ann just said, a hybrid clinic slash writing course that I've taught four times at Rutgers. The gist of it is exactly what Ann just said. It's students fill real research, legal research needs in the public interest community uh, while improving their research, their writing, their oral presentation skills, and I think quite differently than most classes, um, also their peer editing and peer review skills. It culminates in each student sending their memo or research to the outside assigning attorney um, and orally presenting that analysis to the outside uh, attorney. Now, obviously for client confidentiality reasons, I have to have the whole group work for the same outside entity. Uh, so um, once that was Philadelphia's uh, anti-discrimination agency, and just mentioned I'm a commissioner on that agency. Um, and then the other times it's been the Philadelphia Law Department's Civil Rights Unit and Appeals Unit. So the outside attorneys, when they um, request research, I make them fill in, honestly, it's a really difficult, very detailed form but that's intended to anticipate any wrong ways that a student could go um, and to make sure that the ultimate work product is in fact going to be useful to them and that the student's time is spent effectively. You know, if there are websites or particular secondary sources that they can recommend, we try to elicit those um, at the outset to make sure the student really can focus on what's gonna be most useful uh, to the outside attorney. Um, I'm happy to share the research request form. I'm also happy to share my syllabus. So for the first few weeks, these tend to be three L's, sometimes they're two L's. Um, we, we spend a lot of time refreshing their research skills. I'll have Westlaw come in, I'll have Lexis come in. Um, I also teach key legal doctrines that are gonna be necessary to fulfill the um, research requests. So when we partner with the civil rights unit, for example, I'll have them do some basic, um, basic doctrinal um, understanding of section 1983 and certain federal constitutional claims that are often litigated. And obviously I know what the outside attorneys are requesting. So that's what we, focus on. I also think it's important for the students to understand the kind of working conditions and what the office is like. So I actually bring them into the outside attorney's office. We do a field trip, we meet them, and you know they see these piles of documents and not too many legal assistants, not too much secretarial help, and they get a sense about the, the really crushing workload of a lot of these government lawyers who are expected to produce high quality work without a lot of support staff. Um, I think it's kind of eye-opening for the students, but it also helps them to understand who, who is their target audience. This is who they're writing for. So during class, as I said, the peer feedback is mandatory. So we meet each week, three hours a week, and the students give one another peer feedback on every stage of the research and writing process. That includes the research plan, drafts, the outline, um, revised memos. They get all the students provide oral feedback. Particular assigned students each time will give written feedback, but every student in the class is giving oral feedback um, every, every class. Now, during the class, students are also practicing the oral briefing that they're gonna do for the outside lawyer. Um, and the class culminates, as I said, not in just um, providing the written work product to the outside lawyer, but also doing an oral presentation of the research um, or of the memo. It, it's kind of like an oral exam and the law students are surprised at how intense it is. It's, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's a bit like an oral argument. And orally briefing the supervising attorney is of course an essential skill. Um, but these outside attorneys ask them tough follow-up questions. Most of the time they're able to respond to the questions 
right then, but sometimes they have to say, I'm going to have to take a, a day or two to send you a follow up email on that uh, if the questions go outside what they what they know. So the grading is based not just on the individual uh, writing project that each student produces, but also on the quality of the written feedback that they've provided to their peers and the oral feedback that they've provided to their peers. That's one way to make them take that part seriously, but also to understand this is an essential uh, skill in, uh, in law practice. I also grade them on the professionalism of the oral briefing that they do for the outside attorney. So I think this hybrid clinic slash writing model really benefits students. Um, students are motivated by the fact that the research is for a real outside um, attorney. Gaining peer review skills so important in law practice is not something they often get in law school. Improving their oral communication skills, uh, I think they really appreciate that. And labeling it a clinic, the first time I taught it, I didn't label it a clinic, and I did that going forward afterwards. Labeling it a clinic and meeting the outside supervisors, I think, really helped students grasp how important um, this is and the seriousness uh, of the work. I know that at least some students were kind of surprised also that you know some of these cases were in the news and they were, um, I think that was both motivating and maybe a little jarring to realize that like, oh, lots of people are paying attention to this case, not, uh, not just the lawyer I'm working for. So I'll just end with one brief comment from a student um, who took the class. She said, this was, I, I said she, I don't know why. The student said, I have no idea who wrote this. This was the most practical course I had at Rutgers. Knowing my work was being sent to an actual uh, client made me that much more motivated to produce a polished memo. The oral presentation reinforced that point. After presenting my memo to the outside lawyer, I really felt I accomplished a lot. And I thought that was a pretty great review. I mean, that's pretty much what I aimed to do. And so I was happy that um, the student uh, felt that about it. Um, I, I know we're gonna have some opportunities for questions at the end. So I think I'll wrap up maybe a little bit early and I'm very happy to answer any questions about um, any aspect of that. So Anne, thank you so much. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Professor Davis, who's going to talk to us about taking an audience-centered approach to advanced writing courses. Um, thank you. What uh, I was trying to share my screen. Let's see. Uh, can you see my... Let's see here. Yes. Can you still see it? Yep. I can't yep. see you. I'm sorry. You'll have to tell me. Yes, yes, we can okay. see your whole screen. Okay, great. Um, so I thank you very much, uh, Sue, for inviting me. I'm really excited to get to talk about this. I'll start first with a confession. Um, I've not done this yet as a class, but what I have been doing is talking to lawyers about this concept of audience-centered legal writing. Uh, I've, I've spoken with um, different groups of lawyers and judges and judicial clerks. Uh, about this. And so this is uh, what has led me to write about it on the appellate advocacy blog. If you want to go there and give uh, Tessa's blog uh, some uh, more likes and shares, uh, you can read about that there. Uh, but I also, uh, when Sue reached out to me about these ideas, it made me really think carefully about how you might use them in an advanced writing course. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so an audience-centered approach. Well, what, what is it that I'm talking about here? An audience-centered approach to an advanced light writing course is one that centers the instruction around the concept of putting your audience first. So it starts with that idea that if the goal is to influence the thoughts and actions of our listeners um, and our readers, then when we write, our first question ought to be to ask about what needs our audience uh, has and how we can satisfy them and what kinds of audiences we might want to create uh, and satisfy those needs as well. And so how would this approach be different? 
The difference is really about structure and focus. The structure of the course would not be around learning how to write certain documents or particular writing strategies. It would be structured around this concept of audience. Who is reading the writing? Uh, who do we think we are writing to? Who are we leaving out of our audience when we write? And finally then, what strategies might we use that we already know uh, about how to meet our audience's needs? And so while we might end up still teaching about certain skills of practice, we're teaching those in service to the audience, that the idea here is to know what strategies will meet your goal, no matter what the context. So why this approach then for advanced, I'm sorry, I went past my, there we go. Why this approach for advanced writing classes? I think, let me see. Oh, I lost, there, hopefully you can see that. Um, well, I think it is that students are ready for a more sophisticated curriculum uh, in the upper level. Uh, you can use this approach to ground the teaching in scholarship and research about audience and then teach that to students. It lets you problematize the concept of audience. That is, we can help students understand that writing for an audience is a complicated process. We can have them think critically about that to think about the tensions involved in having multiple audiences reading our document, and generally to have a more sophisticated understanding of the concept. And finally, one of the things I really like about an audience-centered uh, teaching approach is the idea that you can offer students a critical approach to what they're doing. And I mean that in two ways, critical in the sense of carefulness about what they're doing, and critical in the sense of exposing and revealing unequal power relationships in institutions and systems. So that's the, that's the general idea that I'm thinking about here. So the idea of audience is discussed in lots of different scholarly literature, uh, but my foundation for thinking about this course comes largely from rhetorical theory. It comes from the classical tradition as well as the critical tradition including two modern writers that I'm gonna speak about in a moment, Edwin Black and Philip Wander. Uh, we can learn about theories of audience from lots of different places. It is absolutely a multidisciplinary concept. You can find scholarship on audience in composition, communication and psychology, just to name three. That's what makes this class have the opportunity to be really robust. You can draw upon a number of different disciplines for developing a course in whatever area that you um, study in your multi multidisciplinary perspective. But from my perspective, what's driving me in thinking about a course like this is three different um, types of audiences. And I just wanted to introduce you to these concepts and spin them out a bit. First, there is the actual audience. That's the one that we know. Uh, they are specific real readers that we can write to. Knowing them as well as we possibly can is the easiest way to meet their needs. So for something like an advanced writing course, you would focus students on learning about audiences and I'll uh, learning about their actual audiences. And I'll talk about that again in a few minutes. But most of the time, we don't really know our actual audience. And we recognize that there are multiple audiences that we write to that we certainly don't have a lot of knowledge about. This is where the imagined audiences come in. So we can't know the readers of our documents um, all the time, or even if we do know them, we can't know everything about them. So we have to imagine those characteristics. This means you know, that we might have to think of a generalized or idealized reader. And that is one that is conjured up in our mind rather than one that we actually know. And whether or not we think we imagine readers, we do, and we can either be deliberate about it or not. And that's where I think an advanced course would come in handy. So for the purposes of a legal writing class, right, we need to be able to be deliberative about imagining our audience. And we can teach students how we make that part an intentional part of the writing process. We can offer them strategies, tasks, and techniques for imagining the audience. And that's part of what I do when I've gone out and talked with lawyers about this so that they can be better and think about this as an intentional part of their writing process. The second consequence of an imagined audience, I think, is even more interesting, and that's the concept of the implied audience. This is the most sophisticated theory in the area of audience analysis, and I think this is what makes uh, the course most interesting, at least in the rhetorical tradition um, that I come from. 
Now, when we talk about the implied audience, uh, there are really three things that we want to think about that would be useful to our students. Various writers have spun out this idea in rhetoric. Um, and those three personas, I think it's the idea of persona. And that's what gets us sort of, I think, really interested in implied audience and for the benefit of our students. The first persona is not as interesting. It's the author of the text. It's that the I, the person who is writing. The second persona is comes from the work of Edwin Black, and it proposes that documents actually call audiences into being. In other words, it's not just the actual audience, but the audience that is constituted in the text. When I think about this advanced concept, it really makes me think about the power of legal writing through the ways in which we choose to write documents. We write not only to audiences that exist, but we create an audience for our document. Um, and so uh, let me say that again, right? The second persona is not just about the audience that we imagine, but also about the one that we create in the text through our writing choices. Now in teaching this idea of second persona, one of the great things that you're able to do is use everyday examples uh, to show how the second persona works. And I've used uh, a headline from a 17 magazine um, website and the headline was everything you need to plan the most epic prom ever. And I won't go into detail here, but what I get to do with audiences that I'm talking to is we sort of deconstruct this title to look at the audience that it calls into being, the one that it thinks should or can uh, be persuaded to do the next click to read this uh, article. By going over this headline, you could do something similar with students, um, a, essentially a rhetorical analysis of who is implied by the way this audience is written. And then another thing that I do in thinking about imagining audiences or thinking about a second persona is thinking about what writing techniques we can attach to the characteristics that we imagine our audiences have. And I'll just give you a quick example of that. So one of the things I give uh, lawyers is a chart and they are asked to answer some questions in the chart, including the audiences they imagine and what characteristics they might have what characteristics they want them to have um, and that kind of thing. And so I give them some examples. So in one of the contexts I was talking about, we had a number of non-legally trained readers. You can, you can see on the screen on the left, uh, it says, you know, what do non-legally trained readers need? They need clarification and guidance about what's going on uh, with more technical legal language. And so what I offered to um, the, this audience was to offer some ideas about how you might start a restatement or to recast or restate a concept. So I gave them some ways to do that. And then we looked at an example from Justice Kavanaugh, a recent Supreme Court opinion um, that shows in the highlighted language there how one might use restatement to more simply state a complicated idea. So again, it's the tactics that we know how to use as writers, but how do we contextualize those uh, when we think about it in the context of particular audiences. And so the final thing that I'll say about the implied audience is what I think is really one of the most interesting or probably the most interesting thing that makes this course a critical course as well as a writing course is this concept of the third persona. This was developed by Philip Wander. Uh, the third persona represents the audiences that are negated by the text. That is, when we have a you that we write to, there is a problem of the they that's excluded. Uh, this is the audience that we leave out, the one that we simply don't pay any attention to or we talk about um, rather than address them directly. So they are either non-existent or they're standing on the sidelines listening to a conversation about them, but one that they're not part of. And I think that has big implications when we think about writing in the context of justice. This is where I think an advanced course could be really useful for helping students understand the work they do as writers. Uh, Wander was writing from the perspective of ideological rhetorical criticism. That's a mouthful. Uh, and this suggests probably what you can imagine, that we can look at language and ask questions about it to reveal its ideology and to show how those positions perpetuate power structures. So I think teaching about third persona can make students not only more effective writers, but more critical readers. Um, I particularly think it helps them be reflective about their own writing choices once they begin to be able to see and read in this close analytical way. 
So just to kind of wrap up, what are some topics that we might cover in an audience first writing course? Well, I mentioned audience theory and research. You could do from many different perspectives, psychology, communication, rhetoric. Uh, I would argue for introducing implied audience and second and third persona. Uh, the breadth could be really extensive on this. Uh, also offering students the opportunity to get to know their audience. The fun things might be interviewing uh, and recording um, interviews with judges, lawyers, and other audiences, or having them come in and talk to the students in the course to get a sense of what their expectations are. Uh, I also think it's really interesting to kind of cover this problem of writing on behalf of others, which is a, a very specific kind of problem. Lawyers are going to be asked to write in teams. They're also going to be asked to write for others who will edit and sign the documents uh, in the court system. If you're a clerk, for example, you're going to be asked to write on behalf of a specific judge, but also on behalf of the institution. And I think, you know, an audience centered approach allows us to think about these special layered audience problems that legal writers have. Um, as I mentioned before, thinking about the topic of implied audiences, the second and third persona, we can think about that as well with respect to close reading and criticism. Um, you know, students can be led through various documents to look for the negated audience and ask about the ethics of that. And then finally, I think there's an opportunity to do some uh, professional identity formation work. Uh, as we know, professional identity formation is now uh, a requirement for education under the ABA accreditation standards. And one of the things I think about professional identity formation is that we've lost one of the critical terms that the Carnegie Report attaches to professional identity formation when it talks about it as the third apprenticeship for students in law school. And that is the Carnegie Report specifically mentions an ethical professional identity, not just a professional identity, an ethical one. And in some recent work, uh, two authors, Fitzpatrick and Cleanan, uh, in writing about professional identity, talk about that what we want to do is have a keen understanding, helping students have a keen understanding of how one's individual values, personal backgrounds, and life experience relate to the work that they're doing in the legal system and the values that the professional community um, is responsible for. So I think a course like this would teach students about developing that ethical professional identity. We can introduce values of the legal profession to help students write for these values. And one of which is that lawyers have a special responsibility for justice. That's one of the ethical obligations in the preamble of the model rules. And so by, again, particularly this idea of the negated audience uh, or audiences that we constitute in the document, we give them a chance to reflect on how their values and the values of the profession sort of come together in writing um, to render you know, just documents or unjust documents to question things about what is ethical in persuasion and what isn't. So thank you very much. Uh, Anne, you can uh, stop. If it's easy for you to stop sharing my screen, great. And I look forward to your questions at the end. All right. Thank you, Kirsten. I'll let you stop sharing it. I can't. Um, you know, I just lost it. I found it. There we go. Okay. Terrific. Thank you so much. Our third speaker is going to be Professor Tessa Dysart. She's going to talk to us about using movie trailers to teach concepts related to appellate advocacy. Also, Professor Dysart has a hard stop today at 1, even though our presentation is going to go till 1.15. So as long as it's okay with our other presenters, we'll do her Q&A immediately after her presentation, and then we'll move on to um, Professor Chesler. So Tessa, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Anne. And I'm so sorry that I have to leave early. I was telling Anne it's been uh, one of those weeks. Um, all right, are you all seeing my screen? Great. Um, so I'd like to talk to, I'm gonna start my timer because I could go forever on this <laughs> particular topic and I wanna make sure I, I stay within my limit. Um, you know, I loved going to the movies uh, when going to the movies was really common and easy, AKA before COVID and two small children. And, and, a, and a part of the experience to me was watching the trailers. And I would sit there and, and I had two things going through my mind. One was, does this trailer represent a movie I wanna watch and who do I wanna watch it with? You know, will I go with my spouse? Will I go with my girlfriends? Does my spouse need to go with his buddies because I don't wanna see the movie? So that was go through my mind. And then I would also think about what does 
what do these trailers tell me about the movie that's coming? And if I hated all the trailers, I would get kind of nervous thinking, I don't want the, you know, the story that's following, because if they think I'm going to like these trailers and, and then like their movie, you know, this is problematic. But if I love the trailers, it sort of whetted my appetite for the movie that was coming, that it was going to be an awesome movie. And uh, for those of us who teach persuasive writing, I think there's a lot that we can use in, in movie trailers about teaching our students to want their audience to want more. So the last movie I saw in the theater was The Rise of Skywalker in fall or winter of 2019 when I had free babysitting in Oregon. And, um, and I was thinking about that. I actually said this to my husband and he's like, yeah, I think that was the last movie. It's just really kind of sad. But anyway, I, want to, I talk about three types of trailers or three types of movie promos that exist. There's teasers. These are usually done about six months before a movie. They rarely contain images of the movie. They're very short. You know, it might be like a black screen and a date. There's a long trailers. Now, typically um, or historically, movie companies could only do a limited number of long trailers that were about four minutes long. And then there's the standard trailer or the short trailer, which is about 90 seconds to two or two and a half minutes. And those come out to promote the movie about two or three months in advance of the movie releasing. And in my class, the trailers that I use are typically this standard trailer. And they're typically about two to two and a half minutes in length. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about how I use trailers in teaching theme in the statement of the facts, which is by far my favorite use. And then if we have time, the summary of the argument. So theme. Um, I teach theme in about week three of my class, and I tell my students that it's one of the first things that they should write and one of the last things that they should rewrite. And I think some of, of starting with theme early on is it really helps them figure out what the case is about. So I show them this meme, um, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, what the heck are we talking about? And I'm sure we've all read those student briefs that don't really get to the point of the issue and even real briefs that don't get to the point of the issue. So I have my students develop a theme to keep their brief oriented on what is the essence of the case. And this can involve law, policy, equity, and, and we talk about different ways to explore a theme. And to use another video analogy, I sometimes talk to them about you know, watching a commercial which again is sort of a thing of the past for those of us who record TV or watch streaming TV. But have you ever watched a commercial and thought, well, what is this commercial about? Is it a cologne commercial? Is it a chip commercial? Is it a beer commercial? Um, and, and that's like not good advertising. And that's similarly not a good way to write a brief. So let me get to the exercise. I've done a couple exercises, but I'm just going to talk about one in interest of time. But if you want to hear about my other exercise, email me and I'm happy to share it. So. Um, in my first exercise, you know, after we've talked about theme and some tips on how to develop it, and I showed them some themes from some big US Supreme Court cases, um, I show them this trailer, the Hunger Games official trailer number one. There's lots of trailers for different movies. So you have to have the right one. So I show them this trailer and I ask them, you know, based on this trailer to come up with, with what they think the theme of the movie is. And they need to you know, they can't, if they've read the books or if they've seen the movie, to try to ignore everything else they know and just base it off of what they see in this trailer. And in this trailer, there's several possible themes. So uh, there's scenes showing Katniss volunteering herself as tribute in place of her sister. There's so, you know, family, sacrifice, sisterly love could certainly be a theme. Um, there's themes showing the oppressive nature of the government. So that there could be several themes developed from those scenes. And there's, uh, you know, some scenes that sort of introduce the love triangle in the movie. So there could be, you know, a, a theme that centers around that. So we talk about, we watch the trailer, we talk about possible themes. Um, and then I ask the students who have either read the books or seen the movie, you know, how well those themes are then portrayed in the rest of the movie and how the movie could be high, could, could go different ways depending on what theme you wanna highlight, right? So if you're gonna highlight the sisterly love, you might minimize you know, some of the discussion of the oppressive government. And if you wanna highlight the oppressive government, you might you know, minimize the love triangle or you know, other aspects of the film. And then I, I tell them 
um, that, you know, they need to, in writing their briefs, convey a theme that both follows through their brief, right? They need to convey a theme that they continue through their brief and through oral argument, but also the theme that entices the reader to want more. And so we talk about then how to do that in our particular case. Now moving on to statement of facts. Uh, like I said, this is my favorite, this might be my favorite assignment in the whole um, semester. And when I talk about statement of facts, I always show my students this quote that I think is maybe a little, like not 100% accurate, but is a good reminder about how important the statement of facts can be. Um, and that they need to be interesting, but also accurate. And to try to explain to my students that it is possible, you can be both interesting and accurate. And so we just barely touch on the statement of facts, then we go right into this particular exercise. Um, I teach online and this assignment works really well online. It can be done in person, it's a little bit more challenging and I can tell you how I've done it in person. So online, I immediately put my students into two breakout rooms. I have a relatively small class, so these are small, two small groups. Um, I have told them that there's a document on our LMS. I'm gonna pull this up here. This is the document I put on our LMS and they should come to class with this document and be ready to fill it out. And then in the class, I have each group watch a trailer for the same movie, but they're different trailers. They only watch one trailer. Um, when I did this in person, I would have the students watch the trailer before they came to class. And then uh, I, in, during the class time, I would ask them to meet together in their groups and talk about the trailer and talk about this form that they filled out. But when I do it online, I can just have them watch the trailer in their group and fill it out. So I give them you know, maybe seven to 10 minutes to do this. Um, then I have them come together and we start answering these questions as, as a group. And I go through, you know, group one, you give me your answers, you know, group two, you give me your answers. And the answers don't always line up despite them having watched the same trailer for the movie. And this is because the movie is Frozen. And there's two very interesting trailers from the movie. I think it was maybe Ruth Ann Robbins, who I know isn't on, or wasn't on this at least uh, last time I looked at the participant list. But she, I think, told me that Frozen was originally supposed to be this like evil ice queen movie and that didn't market well. And so it was shifted more into this sisterly love movie. So the first trailer that the students watch and there's the YouTube link to it is the evil ice queen trailer. You know, we have Elsa and she has cost, cast Arendelle into, you know, this endless winter and Anna and Kristoff, um, you know, are, are going to come to the rescue. And it's funny because I tell them they can't, the students to not use any pre-knowledge. So they're like the redheaded princess <laughs> and the ice guy. So it's cute to see them try to explain the movie without using names. Well, the second trailer is the sisterly love trailer, right? Elsa is, has these powers and she doesn't know how to control them. And she's afraid and she's alone and she wants to fix it, but she doesn't know how to fix it. And her sister is going to save her. And it's just, it's, you know, for anyone with a sister, it's a delightful, delightful trailer. Interestingly, both trailers use many of the same images from the movie and the same scenes from the movie. So when I have time in class, I like to show the entire class, both trailers. And we talk about how using the same images from the movie, you can get two very different views of what the movie is going to be about. And I say, look, this is so, the statement of facts is so powerful to sort of prime your reader for your narrative. You have to be accurate, you can't lie, but how you portray the characters can influence how the judge is going to think about the remainder of the story that you're telling and the legal arguments that you're raising. And the judge, you want the judge to want to rule for you, right? So regardless, you know, obviously you want the law on your side and that's your best argument, but you also want the judge to feel good about ruling for your client. And one of the best ways to do this is through the statement of facts. Um, I suspect I'm gonna need to find some new trailers soon, both with Hunger Games and Frozen. Up to this point, my students are aware of both movies, but I don't suspect that that will last forever. All right, the last thing, and I'll touch on this just very briefly, is summary of the argument. And I actually teach this as, an, um, as a flipped class. So my students watch a lecture. I see if they have questions. I don't spend um, as much time on it as I probably could, but, you know, 
time is precious in these classes. And so um, I don't show them trailers, but I talk about trailers. And that's because actually Justice Thomas has analogized the summary of the argument to a preview where Justice, the late Justice Scalia has called it redundant. And so I tell my students, look, some judges think it's redundant, some view it as a preview, you've got to treat it as important. I think in reality, a movie trailer isn't a great way to think about a summary of the argument. It should be more like the ultra cliff notes, but it could also be a way, and this is something I could think about in the future, of using it to teach introduction, because I think theme and introduction both could mirror, um, you know, maybe a teaser movie trailer. So that's, I'm going to stop there. I know I'm almost at my time. I'm going to stop my share, but I welcome any questions. All right, thank you so much, Tessa. Um, does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? If so, just feel free to unmute and ask away. Well, while you're all thinking of a question to ask, I do have a question for you, Tessa. Um, you noted at the end that you're thinking about choosing some new trailers um, uh, for future classes. And one thing that I struggle with sometimes when it comes to um, things like showing a movie trailer or a TV clip or a pop culture reference is uh, how to go about choosing a good one. And because I'm always thinking, well, I don't want it to be something that might confuse students from another country. I don't want it to maybe be, uh, you know, too violent, too sexy, too, you know, too, too whatever. So I was wondering if you had any advice on how to, you know, choose a, a movie or a movie trailer that could kind of uh, be useful, but not necessarily exclude any students or make anyone uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, I've thought about this in other analogies um, or in other exercises, like if I'm going to talk about Goldilocks to my international students, you know, are they familiar with it? I think from my experience in living in other countries, the big blockbuster movies in the U.S. are typically fairly well known in, in many countries, assuming they're not too recent, right? So sometimes there's a lag in when, um, like when I lived in Russia, when movies would come to Russia, and now we have the cats. Um, so I think the key for some of these assignments, it's helpful if most of the students have seen the movie because then they can compare the trailer to how well it tells the you know ultimate story. Um, so that can be can be hard. Uh, so I, I guess I don't have any great way other than I, I remember one of my other. Um, exercises that I didn't talk about. I watched a lot of movie trailers. I also always ask, you know, the social media hive if anyone has good recommendations. I think Twitter could be another good place to ask for recommendations for things that might work. But um, I think picking something, if your goal is, you know, with theme to talk about how well the theme has been expressed throughout the movie or how different themes could be expressed throughout the movie based on the trailer, having movies that the students have watched where they can compare the trailer and then the movie is is important so picking big popular movies can help disney is always very safe in terms of of cleanliness uh so that's good to know <laughs> okay terrific thank you does anyone else have a question for tessa and feel free to email me if you want any of the trailers and links um i'm happy to to share that or other trailers that i've used in other theme assignments Tessa, I was just going to ask really quickly. Um, so when you identify multiple themes in a trailer, right, do you translate that into thinking about how they're going to choose theme? Because I mean, I would I would think what's really great is the same story can have multiple themes and you can identify that differently. And I was wondering maybe how you bridge that in terms of choosing which one you might or multiple ones. How do you handle that? Yeah. So I talked to my students about, um, you know, what is what is really at issue in this case? What is the flashpoint of controversy? What's your strongest argument? Because often your theme, I think, results from your strongest argument or, or you know, the, the best thing you're going to put before the court. And so I do tell them, you don't all have to have the same theme in, in writing your brief. And in fact, and I think The Hunger Games is a great trailer for this because there are so many themes, like really good themes that you could have a really good movie that focused on each of those individual themes more than other, you know, sub themes. Um, and, and so I, yeah, we, we do talk about, you know, different ways to pick your themes. I like to use the Guberman has his, he talks about several ways to develop theme. Um, 
two of the best ones are sort of why this matters and um, what this is not. And so those are, are two I talk about. Why it matters, I think, is one of the, the best of explaining to the court why this case is important. Um, and I think the, the Hunger Games trailer does that well. But yeah, there could definitely be multiple themes. This makes me also too think, and then I'll be quiet, the idea of sub themes right? That there would be, I mean, movie trailers obviously do that, right? You always want a theme that attaches to your legal position, but, you know, other themes that create feeling around that, that can be, you know, strategically deployed would be great. Thanks. Yeah, they, they absolutely can. I, I think my students, just getting them focused on like, what is your best argument and what, you know, because that oral argument, which we're just getting into in my class, I imagine a lot of you are as well, you know, re reminding them at when in doubt, you can always come back to your main theme is uh, you know, my students are doing a border cell phone search case or forensic search of a cell phone. And so there's immense privacy interests in your cell phone that the Supreme Court has recognized. Boom. That's a great theme. And that's something you can keep coming back to in, in your oral argument. Um, and so I, I think for students, what they struggle the most with theme is thinking broader than just so-and-so was arrested at the border, you know, or Katniss had to compete in the Hunger Games. Like, why? Well, because she sacrificed herself, because there's an oppressive government. And so kind of bringing them up a little bit from the narrow theme is, is what I try to do. And, I, and again, the theme, the movies do this really well. All right, are there any other questions for Tessa? All right, well, seeing none, uh, thank you so much, Tessa. We really appreciate it. Um, and we will move on now to our final speaker. Um, Professor Chesler is going to talk about how she incorporates student presentations and current events into her contract drafting course through her contract in the news assignment. Hello, everyone. Let me just get this started. All right, I'm hopeful everyone can can see Sarah you I can see you so give me a thumbs up Sarah you can see excellent thank you all good all good <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a very specific assignment that I use in my um, contract drafting and negotiating class that can definitely pretty easily be adapted into other advanced legal writing courses in fact uh Kim Holst here has used this um, in or adapted it and used it in her ADR advanced drafting class. So I'm going to start with, um, I just wanted to show you the assignment. You don't necessarily have to read all of it. I'll, I'll give you the highlights. Uh, basically, what I do is I ask the students to research a current news story. And by current, I tell them about in the past six months involving drafting, interpreting, or negotiating contracts or the related ethical duties of the parties involved, which is basically what I cover uh, as the substance in my course. They can pick a story that relates to any field of interest to them. It can be sports, it can be business. Um, it somehow has to obviously relate back to a contract drafting or interpretation issue. I give them some ideas. It can come from a newspaper, it can come from other online news sources. I give them some blogs that relate to contract drafting, or it can be about a recent case so they can find it on Westlaw Lexus or Bloomberg. And for the assignment, they have to do two things. They have to make a brief presentation to the class about their news story. Uh, I tell them it needs to be about five to seven minutes and they can use a visual presentation aids. They can use handouts, whatever they want. But following that five to seven minute presentation, they have to present one or two questions to the class for discussion and then lead that discussion. Um, and the second part of the assignment actually comes first. And when it's due, they have to write a very short, like one page write up of the news story and post it on my course page. And they have to do that the day before the assignment and include some links to the sources. And I do that really for my own purpose because I do like to read what the story is about and read some of the sources. Sometimes I even do a little additional research, research on my own so that if the student is not necessarily doing a great job of engaging the course in discussion, I know enough about it. So I can pipe in and, and I can sort of lead some of that discussion as well. 
And for both of those parts, the presentation and the writing combined, it is worth 15% of their final grade. A um, couple of details, just in terms of administration of the assignment. I do do my contract to the news assignment first. So in class two, <coughs> excuse me, I present, I have already posted on the course webpage, my write up with the links. And I present my five to seven minute discussion of a news story and engage the class with my one or two discussion questions. I do that so they really understand the expectations that I have for the assignment. I didn't do that when I first started this. And depending upon honestly who goes first, sometimes it didn't necessarily set uh, the right level of rigor um, for the assignment. So I like to do mine first so they know what I expect. In terms of scheduling, I randomly pick two students per class over eight course periods. I have 16 students in my class. Even though they're assigned two students per class, they are individual. They do not work together. We just have two separate presentations in each of those classes. I allocate approximately 30 minutes, um, which would cover their five to, minute, to seven minute presentation, their discussion questions, and usually my further discussion questions with the class. Um, as I mentioned, both assignments are worth 15%. I grade them quite liberally. Everyone does well. No one really does poorly, even though I have three categories below average, average, and above average, which I then assign points at the end. I think in all the years I've been doing this, I had one student uh, who received a below average who basically spoke for one minute and had one question and just did not, clearly did not put the effort in. Uh, the goals that I had when I when I created this assignment was uh, primarily to have students get a better understanding of how the concepts we learn in class really play out uh, in real life. Um, presenting an opportunity to incorporate current events into my class. You know, I start the semester by saying contracts are everywhere. They are in everything we do. And yet there is absolutely no way I can keep up with or incorporate all of that into class. So this is a really good way to get the students to bring me some stories that we can talk about in class that are much more current. Um, it presents an opportunity to incorporate different types of contracts in my class. Um, so my class, usually students draft two or three different kinds of contracts and revise and edit others. But um, they all come into this class with very different interests. So I asked them on the first day, you know, what about contract drafting interests you? And they always reference the, a wider race. I want to go into sports law. I want to be an M&A lawyer. Um, I just want to do, you know, property law, real estate. And obviously there's no way we can have that many assignments in class. So this is a way that we can talk about different types of contracts without taking up too much of class time. Um, it does serve the benefit. Students get to practice and improve research skills, uh, writing skills, not much, but they do have to write concisely, uh, but I think primarily oral presentation skills. And they have to know enough about the subject matter um, to talk about it and teach the students about it. So it really, they do much more research um, than I expect, and that's to just to get themselves feel comfortable talking about it or leading the class in the discussion. Um, it does give students some control over content of a portion of the class materials, which I think is really nice. Um, and it is interactive. It gets every single student has to do it. And so it really does get them engaged. Um, there are some benefits that have come up that I didn't plan on. Um, I learned so much about different contract areas. For example, I really literally know nothing about sports. All I know about sports is the sports stories my students present in their contract in the news. Um, but I do get to learn a lot about current events involving uh, contract drafting. It's also really fun. Obviously, students tend to pick stories that are engaging to them. It is rare that a student just picks uh, kind of a really boring court case that has come down recently. So it is it is really fun. Uh, it develops student camaraderie. They all, all engage in the discussion because they know what it's like if they're at the front of the room and no one answers any of the questions. So students get really engaged. Um, it reinforces the concepts I teach in class, which to me is fantastic. So they'll even say in their pre presentation, for example, 
like Professor Chesler told us three weeks ago, it is really important to use the recitals to do A, B, and C. And so they, it really, I think, helps reinforce that I'm not just making this up and that it's not just pie in the sky contract drafting, it's actually contract drafting issues that come up uh, in practice. They seem to have an amazing recall of the contracts in the news stories. So, you know, weeks later, if we cover a topic that was mentioned in a contract in the news story, someone always says, well, like Barry said in his story about X, Y, and Z, that's why this, this is important or this is what we should keep in mind. Um, and also it takes away a half hour class, to be honest, uh, and puts it more on the onus uh, of the students, which, which is always nice uh, in a two hour class period. Um, I did just wanna give you a couple of examples of how fun and interesting and diverse. So this is just from this semester so far, we're about halfway through. Uh, one student presented on the Elon Musk and Twitter story. Uh, in terms of the contract called for both specific performance as a remedy for failing to go through with the deal, or also it re referenced a $1 billion contractual breakup fee. Will either one of those apply? Uh, there was a story about golf and the contractual restrictions in golf players' contracts. Uh, New Jersey has a proposed legislation about restricting the enforceability of non-competes. So that got us talking about more public policy issues. Um, at the time, there was a railroad union's tentative agreement. It has now since failed, uh, but we talked about the particular aspects of that and how we might draft the agreement to meet the needs of the railroad union employees. There's always been in the past couple of years, lessons from the pandemic, obviously that hits home. Uh, another one was about environmental, social, and governance clauses in contracts and uh, comparing the U.S. approach to the European approach. Um, actually, that one in particular gave me an idea for something my, I might include in my next article. So that's even a bigger bonus. Uh, in terms of me learning a lot, it actually gave me some thoughts about something I might want to write about. And then just this week, uh, a student talked about the enforcement or the actually the unenforceability of uh, Uber's arbitration clause that is present in their clip, click wrap uh, contract. And so we got to talk about that as well. And just the last thing I wanna present before I leave us with all our questions and answers, uh, questions that might come up, um, kind of some tips in case you wanna do this uh, in your class. I highly recommend modeling the first contract in the news right up in presentation. Uh, it reduces student anxiety as well as sets the expectations. Um, set very specific expectations uh, for the presentation, specifically in the amount of a time you expect them to speak. And I didn't initially specifically say draft one to two discussion questions. I said, be prepared to lead a discussion. And that didn't quite work as well as telling them to actually come in uh, with one or two discussion questions. Uh, in terms of the write-up lessons I learned, I initially started with having them submit the write-up on the morning of their presentation. And then I realized, why am I doing that to myself? Because then I had a lot to do to get ready for class that day. So um, I highly recommend having them do that the day before and making sure they include some links. Um, again, so it's easy to do some, you know, kind of backup research on your own just by following their links. And I always now come prepared to engage the class if necessary. And I will leave it with that. And I think Anne will take over with some questions people might have for everyone who's spoken. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, Sue. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left for Q&A. So if anyone has questions for Sarah, for Kirsten, or for Sue, and I do see that Sarah, you have your hand raised. So please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually, I, I was noticing that the last bullet point was adaptable to other classes. And as you were talking, I was thinking about how beautifully adaptable this would be for my current issues in civil rights litigation. Mm. Uh, students already spontaneously bring news articles to class all the time because the stuff we're doing is in the news all the time. But I hadn't really thought about integrating that as a more formal part of the curriculum and I mean, I could even see making it just like 
do three minute, do a three minute presentation on this and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, what a great idea to make that an actual formal part of the, of the curriculum so that students constantly realize these are not dry academic topics. This is truly the stuff of every day. So great ideas. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think, you know, in some classes, it comes more naturally, right? So if someone is signing up for your class, current issues in civil rights, you know, they all have things in their personal lives that they read or they're interested in. And I think it was less obvious in contract drafting, which maybe could seem a little dry. And I wanted it to be more interesting and less dry and more like um, those topics that kind of really resonate with students. So it, it works for me. All right, I think Kim had her hand up and then Sarah. Yeah, I was just gonna chime in. I thought that in my ADR class, students would have a hard time finding a, a current event news story that they thought was interesting, but it has actually been the opposite. And it's kind of amazing because I do tell them, like Sue said, these are parts of everyday life. You see them everywhere, these concepts. Um, and it just really does make it clear that this is this may seem like a, a class that is limited to a specific subject matter, but it will apply across your practice. And that's it's always a nice way to reinforce it. Um, so my question is for Sarah. Um, for the for the projects with the nonprofits, I guess I'm curious what kind of projects you're getting for over the course of a semester, because it seems like such a long time frame for those that are in, I don't, if they're in active litigation or like, is it is it like, a, I'm just curious about what types of projects you're getting. What types of projects, sure. So um, uh, for example, um, the city of Philadelphia civil rights lawyers, it's a pretty big unit uh, within the um, civil rights, uh, within the law department. So the law department is like 160 lawyers. The civil rights unit is itself about um, I don't know, 12, 15. So it's it's a it's like a small law firm. So they see certain recurring issues. And one of the recurring issues they saw, for example, was um, Fourth Amendment taser law was a mess. And they couldn't really figure out what the governing rules should be. So what they tasked um, actually four students in the class to do was uh, survey all the circuits, identify the trends, and are we seeing particular trends in Fourth Amendment taser law? And is there some sort of evolution we could identify? Um, and what approach should we be taking? You know, is this an alternative to guns or is this an alternative to um, somebody talks back to the police officer and they can tase them, right? So we were seeing a lot of overuse of tasers. Um, so that that was that's a, a one project. A different one was um, a very serious and heinous um, situation had ar arisen where a young woman had been um, basically held prisoner for years uh, by a relative and kept in a closet. And the question arose whether the social workers who acquiesced, although did not recommend this placement for the um, child way back when it first happened years ago, were they entitled to qualified or absolute immunity? And whether social workers are entitled to um, absolute immunity is an evolving issue. Circuits have split on that. So um, they knew this issue was going to come up at some point. The case was in active litigation. It was not going to trial, but it was in motion practice. And so the, the two students working on that um, were coming up with arguments for why the social worker should not be held responsible for the kidnappers' um, years of violence. Um, so yeah, I mean, fascinating issues, but they they are a big law office. They can anticipate future legal research needs. They're not the type of office that's, you know, dealing with 10 new clients every day. That's not what they do. Um, and they also, you know, because the city of Philadelphia is one of the biggest cities within the Third Circuit, they are also sort of setting the standard for a lot of these claims. And a lot of smaller cities are going to be following 
in their footsteps. So some of their research can also be shared with other cities within um, the Third Circuit. Those are just two examples. No, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for our speakers today? Um, I have a quick question actually for Sue um, about your contracts in the news. I'm curious, what has the reception been from students? It sounds like you're saying it's been mostly positive, but have you had any pushback from students who were reluctant or concerned about this type of assignment? Not at all. Um, you know, sometimes there's one or two students that um, say in advance, I'm really nervous about public speaking, but since I do it first and it's so informal, and every time a student goes, the whole class claps, even if it wasn't great, it's just really supportive environment that I have really never had any pushback or any student complain about it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll follow up your comment, Sue. I, I think that, yes, public speaking is terrifying for the <laughs> students. And they know, therefore, that they need the practice. Mm -hmm. So what you've done is create kind of a low stakes, you know, mm -hmm. five minutes, seven minutes. It's not yeah. too long. Yeah. Um, and since everybody's going to have to do it, you have a pretty supportive audience. So I, I think that's just all to the good to get students talking up in front of one another. And each time they do it, it's less stressful. Yeah. And, and my students are almost primarily three L's. So this definitely isn't the first time someone has forced them to speak in public. Um, and again, you're right, Sarah, it's of all the probably public speaking they've had to do in law school, this seems the easiest. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, and I have a question for Kirsten. Um, I'm wondering if you've given some thought to what type or types of upper level writing classes would be well suited for the type of audience focused um, uh, you know, education and training that you shared with us today? Well, I mean, certainly you could think about it on a narrow frame, just in the way I've been doing it with, um, with uh, lawyer audiences. So you could think about, you know, you could think about talking to um, judges and so judicial writing, right? You could think about a judicial writing course as being audience centered. You could think about someone who's going to be clerking, uh, trial lawyers, appellate lawyers. I mean, you could do it from that perspective. But what I think is great about this is um, if you take an audience-centered perspective, then you can have a real breadth of documents, a real breadth of audiences that might be helpful to you, right? So it could be more, um, the purpose is thinking through the audience perspective less than the particular area of practice. So that's, you know, as I think about designing it, it would be more focused on using those principles and what you've learned. And then each one of these different scenarios would be a way to practice it in the context of a particular audience that you're writing to. And then I imagine a very critical component of it too, where we sit down and we really dig into this question of the negated audience and can do some criticism of documents that way as well. So I don't know how many components that is. That's a lot, but yeah, but thank you. All right, terrific. So um, it is 1.15, so we've reached our, uh, time to conclude this program. I just want to again thank all of our presenters for sharing your ideas with us today. Uh, you know, many creative ways to enhance the learning experience in a traditional upper level course. We were all walking away with uh, some knowledge to put in our back pocket for our future courses going forward. Uh, much thanks also to everyone who took the time today to attend the, this workshop during this very busy mid semester time for all of us. I'd like to also acknowledge my colleagues, Sue Chesler, Kim Holst. Thank you so much for planning this three-part series. Uh, if you'd like to review a recording of today's program, we should have a recording posted within the next couple of weeks uh, on our ASU Law Legal Method and Writing webpage. And please join us on Friday, November 18th um, at 12 p.m. Pacific time for our third and final webinar. The topic will be half-baked ideas for innovative advanced legal writing courses. Uh, please note that we will require registration for this workshop because we are going to have small breakout groups and some interactivity during this, um, this uh, webinar. So uh, with that said, thank you all. Um, have a wonderful weekend and we will see you at our November presentation.